Grace and peace be unto you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. What a blessing it is when we get to come together in worship, however we may be today. Because if our hearts are with God, then we are worshiping people. Be it in the sanctuary or in our deployed locations in our homes, God is with us. That is a promise that stands true, strong, and fast. So may we join our voices together, if we are able, as we sing together an opening hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Thanks be to God. If you will join with me, we will share in our call to worship for the day. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. My soul speaks. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will hope in God. The Lord is good to those who wail, to the soul that seeks God. In this time of waiting, may we know God's presence and faithfulness endure forever. May our souls speak for us in putting our hope and trust in God. May we worship without ceasing wherever we are, for we are forgiven, loved, and restored. Amen. And again, we will join our voices with our first hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Yo 
separated over distance and space, that does not mean that the holy ground is absent from us. Because wherever we are, God is with us. And so as a people that come together before our God, it is one of the greatest blessings for us to be able to share in our joys and our concerns with and for one another. And so most specifically, O oh God, we turn this day with the joys of knowing that we have a chance to take a pause, a moment to sit and be still and know that you are God. We also know that in this time we pray for those who are suffering with illness and disease, as well as those who are working from the bottom of their heart and with all of their toil and energy to find answers and solutions. We pray for the doctors and the nurses, those that are working in the testing facilities. We pray for those who are essential personnel, those who in the face of the onslaught of what's taking place remain in place, continuing to work. We pray for those who put themselves at risk so that we might be kept safe. And most especially, God, we pray that you give us a mindset that none of us are stuck at home. We are safe at home because you keep us safe. So let us turn our minds and our hearts in an attitude of prayer at this time before we go our about. Lord, as we come, we pray for an indwelling and powerful lifting up of your Holy Spirit. We know that the sanctuary that you give to us doesn't have to be in this place. It doesn't have to be about the pews or the wall or the ceiling or the floor in this sanctuary. Instead, you desire for us to have a sanctuary in our hearts. You desire for us to take our very lives and make it be a worship space. Your desire is for us to take our worship and make it to be a mode of living. And so God, challenge us. May this be a moment, a time, and a place for us to open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to feel and know, our hands to figure out new ways to give and serve, our feet to remain firmly planted right in your life. Firmly planted on the root, the foundation of our faithfulness. Because in the face of whatever this virus is, we know that the mustard seed of our faith challenges us to see new and different ways. It challenges us to open our eyes with new opportunity. So, oh God, we pray, still us. Give us a peace that passeth all understanding. Awaken us to new opportunities to find spiritual disciplines, to sit and pray, to hold those that are close to us in our hearts. To reach out with the kind of faith that says, Lord, you have stilled me in this moment. Now fill me in this moment. Lord, we are up to the challenge. Because we know that there is nothing that you cannot do on our behalf. In fact, we hear the words over and over and over again. Nothing is impossible with you. And so, Lord, we pray for the possibilities. We pray for the new opportunities. We pray for the spirit of resurrection that opens everything for us, that turns us from death into life and life eternal. And so, God, we pray. We pray with earnest lives, hearts, souls, minds, bodies. We pray. If there is anything we can do, we can pray. And there is power in prayer. And so may we take that. May we be equipped by that. May we be disciplined by that. And may we knew, know in a newness that you refresh us, you encourage us, and you show us. And so, Lord, may we take time to unite our voices together as we pray that special prayer that you taught us to say together, wherever we are, with voices united. Our, our Father... Father 
who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May we also know that the blessing of what we have, for many of you have taken the time and you have sent in your tithes, your offerings, and your gifts. Know that this place remains solidly in ministry. Even from a distance, God is at work in this place. And so we pray that a blessing be fully upon these gifts of tithes, offerings, and encouragement that we ourselves may continue in the ministry of whatever takes place here in the future. And so we turn these gifts back over to you, O oh God, in this time, in this place, in this moment. Lord, take these tithes, offerings, and gifts and bless them. Bless them as they go into this community and our community abroad so that they might be a blessing for and with each other. And Lord, may you bless our hearts that we find new and different ways to serve you wherever we may be. For it truly is the greatest of all blessings to know that you remain solidly planted in your faithfulness in us. And so may we solidly plant ourselves in faithfulness to you, however we may be. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're able, then, we will join our voices as we sing our next hymn, Are Ye Able, Said the Master.
Toby, if you'll come forward and be with me, because you are part of my young friends today. And a special message to all of my young friends who are not here with me in the sanctuary. Remember Pastor John's promise to you last week, it remains solidly and true. For each of you that aren't here with me today, know that there is a special piece of candy that's being put in your bag so that when you finally do come back here, for every Sunday you've not been here, you will have that additional piece of candy. So Toby brought with me here a special book I asked him to, to share with us. And it says on the top of this book, it's a read, search, and find life long ago. You know, as we've spent some time over this couple weeks, it's felt like maybe we're living in a time or a place that's from long ago, learning and doing and finding new things. But in this book, Toby, what's the purpose of this book? What, what do we do with this book? Look, look for stuff. We look for stuff. So on each one of these pieces of, of this book, right, it, it tells us that, what are, what are we supposed to do? Find stuff. Find stuff. So it gives us a whole search and find list up here. And, and it says we're supposed to find six birds. Can you find six birds in that book? Oh, okay. So there they are. So these things aren't really super easy to find, are they? No, sometimes we take a little bit of time that we have to look over every little section and piece of this to find exactly what it is we're looking for. But it's kind of fun because it gives us a challenge, right? What's one of the things that we've been putting together on our dining room table together as a family? Food. Well, yes, we've been, <laughs> we've been having food together as a family. What else have we been doing? Making pictures out of puzzles. puzzles. We've been doing a lot of jigsaw puzzles, haven't we? And sometimes we have to search really, really, really hard to find that missing piece. Sometimes we even take pieces and we shove them into a spot that they might not necessarily belong in, right? Yeah. And then we have to go back and try and find what piece went where it wasn't supposed to go. But that's all part of the challenge. You know, this time as we come together, sometimes we have to look and look really hard to find the things that are good or exciting or fun. But if we do it together as a family, if you, my little friends that are out there, make it a point to find the fun, to find the joy for you, my big kids out there, if you make it a point to find the joy, to find the fun, to find the opportunities, you will find that God's love remains. And we don't have to search very far to find it. It's not like these puzzle books that you have to look really hard. It's not like the jigsaw puzzles that fit together sometimes easy and sometimes hard. God's love never gets shoved in, never gets forced in, never gets punched in. God's love is always the most important thing that we have. How about we pray this morning? Sound good? Lord, we thank you for this day, for your love, because it always fits perfectly. We don't have to search very hard. You're always there. So let us open our eyes and see you, because you love us, and you keep us safe now and always. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be your children, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Here's your book back. Thank you. Don't forget a piece of candy, Toby. Our gospel reading for the day is a fairly lengthy one. There's a lot for us to chew on. So if we hear now the reading from the gospel of John, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 45, and I will be reading today from the New Revised Standard Version. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. 
Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary got up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit, deeply moved, in fact. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who... Open the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying. Then Jesus, again, 
greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out. His fans, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth. And his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the warming of all of our hearts as we come to full knowledge of what God has in store for us. From this, the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Friends, I'm going to tell you that this gospel reading comes to us at pretty much a, a perfect time in our own history. We don't exactly know the science behind what's taking place. We don't fully understand the, the, the whole concept of COVID-19. There's all kinds of skepticism and fear and doubt and concern. There's thoughts about whether this has been here for a while or if it just appeared. There's been concern whether we're reacting too heavily or not enough. But I hear the words from Jesus pretty loudly today. This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory. So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, you might ask yourself, is, is Pastor John now suggesting that none of these deaths are true? Absolutely not. Because when we hear, even from this gospel reading, Lazarus died. Lazarus' death was real. Lazarus, Lazarus in fact, was so dead, it says that he was stinking dead. Four days dead in the tomb. But Jesus had power and dominion over that. So you might ask yourself, are, are we supposed to die to this? Is this disease supposed to overwhelm us? Supposed to take us? I don't have those questions. But when I hear this gospel reading, what I hear is that Jesus is still calling us out of our tombs. Because we get ourselves all wrapped up in the tombs of our own fear, our own doubt, our own concern. Some of us push the limits and the boundaries and say, I've got this. I know better than anybody else how to take care of me, myself, and I. And God is saying to us, no different than he did the disciples, I want to use this as a moment, a teaching moment. What does it look like for us to expand out of our comfort zone? What does it mean for us to expand our understanding of worship beyond what takes place in a sanctuary? What does it mean for us to have pews that are empty and yet hearts that are still filled with worshipful opportunities? 
What does it mean for us to be the people of God? That in the face of doubts, in the face of death, in the face of disease, remain solidly planted in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's the challenge that we get to see. It's not easy. It wasn't easy for Mary and Martha because as Lazarus was dying, they sent out the word. They sent out the message. Jesus, come back. The one that you love is dying. Come close. Come here. The message didn't get missed. Jesus heard it. He never stopped having faith. Mary and Martha may have. You and I, we do. God never does. So as the disciples were urging Jesus, don't go back. Bethany, you don't want to go back to Bethany. You've been bullied. You've been pushed around. You've been threatened. Those people back there, they want to kill you. Why in the world would you go back there, Jesus? Just let the dead bury the dead. It's fine. Let's keep on our ministry right where we are. Let's keep on this path of least resistance. Let's socially distance ourselves from what's taking place there in Bethany. And Jesus waited. But when he went back, he used it as a moment. Because Martha, it says, heard that he was coming and met him before he even got to the village. And Martha's words are often our own. Jesus, if you had only been here, he wouldn't have died. God, if you were truly in control, I wouldn't be stuck in my own home. God, if you could just make this all go away in the snap of a finger, we'd all be better off. Lord, if you would just answer my prayers, I wouldn't have to social distance myself anymore. I could go back to work. I could go do what I want to do. I could go in and, and every store and touch every item and shake hands and hug people and give kisses. I can do exactly what it is that I want to do. I'm ready. God, just take this away. But even in the face of Martha's doubts, even in the face of our own doubts, I picture something that takes place in the scene. Now, this is John Bell's paraphrasing. This is John Bell's interpretation. This is John Bell's commentary of this moment. This is John Bell putting himself into this moment because this is what I see. Martha asked the question, Lord, if you had only been here, Jesus' response is, your brother's going to rise again. And Martha, like the key theologian, had all of the perfect answers. She could pass all of Jesus' written exam questions better than the other disciples. Because she says, Lord, I know he will rise again with the resurrection in the last day. Martha had been listening. Martha heard every word of Jesus' instruction. She knew his test answers better than any of the other disciples. But she was missing the real piece of the question that was being asked. And this is where I hear and see and know. I can answer all the questions in Scripture. I've got the theology degrees down pat. But if I miss and you miss 
the relationship with Jesus Christ, you miss everything. So when I hear this passage, what I see truly, loudly, and clearly is that Jesus grabs Martha by the face, looks into her eyes, looks into her soul, looks into her life and love, and says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Don't we all need to hear that? With everything that's going on, don't we need that affirmation, that reality, that personal reflection of Jesus who reaches out to us, grabs us by our face and says, I've got this. I am. I am. It's in these moments when we get ourselves all wrapped up. My wife posted something yesterday about being stuck at home with kids is almost like having a, a parrot that sits on your shoulder and never stops squawking in your ear. And we have four of those parrots sitting on our ears. But you know, coming out of the tomb of this, I would rather not be anywhere than with those squawking parrots than with those boys who in moments when we have our own doubts, like Reed, who said to me this past week, Dad, it's about faith. Plant yourself firmly in the faith. It was a moment where God's hands grab your face and say, I am the resurrection and the life. All of the other stuff, it goes away. The chaos of the moment, the toilet paper shortages, the goofiness of people's reactions, the panic. When we are called out of our tombs, it's not the tomb of our death. It's the tomb of our own lives that we've made, where we've let all kinds of other busyness and the stuff of our day in and day out lives, which doesn't amount to a hill of beans, get in the way of what matters most. And Jesus is still in that business of reaching out and grabbing our face just like he did Martha to say, I am. I am. Not only am I the resurrection and the life, I am love. I am joy. I am peace. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the one who will take the rod and the staff and go with you all the way down into the depths of the valley of the shadow of death and I will bring you through to the other side. I am the one who will live with you in your home, sitting beside you on your couch. I am the one who will fill that moment with fear and doubt, with joy and hope. I am! Our God's promise remains solid and true, just as it was for Martha as he reached out and touched her face and said, I am the resurrection and the life. Have faith. In these moments when we as our own people of, of faith are left with a whole bunch of questions, how do I go about doing a worship service when there's nobody here but my own family and they hear me preaching at them day in and day out at home and then they get to fill this sanctuary with them seated in different places just so it can make it feel 
like the place is full. I don't see empty seats. I see a full opportunity for us to find God wherever it is that we are. Will we be back for Palm Sunday? I doubt it. Will we be back for Easter Sunday? Truly not sure. But what I do know is that whenever we come back to this place, it will be the greatest and the best Resurrection Sunday because all of us will be brought out of our tombs and all of us will get to be able to celebrate the joy of a resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ in person, the resurrection of our own spirits coming out of our tombs, the resurrection of a sanctuary being able to be refilled, the resurrection of new spiritual disciplines. Because I ask and urge you, each and every one, to be like that Martha who says, I, I've got the answers, Jesus. You are the resurrection, right? Jesus, Lazarus, he'll, he'll, he'll come back. But have we taken that moment to let Jesus grab us by our face to say, I am. I am here. Wherever here is. I am here. And just when Martha had finally received her own confidence, she ran back and she told Mary the exact same words. Jesus is here. And Jesus went running in his own place, firmly rooted, because Jesus didn't move. But Jesus' spirit it ran in Mary's heart because she came running and she looked at him and she said the exact same words of fear and doubt as Martha. Jesus, if you had only been here, he would not have died. And he revealed himself in the very same fashion. Because Mary's grabbing him. Mary, the one who anointed him, went down on her own hands and knees and wiped his feet with her hair. And she said, Jesus, he loved you. And you loved him. Why? And the greatest and most real moment that we get to find awakens us to the full emotions of just what our God does because it says Jesus began to weep. Jesus was so broken and so concerned for his people. That he began to weep. Don't think for a second that Jesus doesn't still weep for us. When we turn our hearts from him, when we go in the wrong direction, when we miss the mark, when we have our own skepticism, and yet in the midst of God's weeping, he still reaches out with his hand like he did for Martha and says, I am. The resurrection and the life. And just to prove how real it is, Jesus goes to that tomb. Four days dead, stinking dead, decomposition dead, rotting dead. Jesus calls out, Lazarus, come out. I think it's important for us to know just how dead Lazarus was. Because you and I, you and I can do nothing. 
that will remove us from the love of our God. If Jesus can take Lazarus, who was four days stinking dead, and bring him back to life, just how amazing can our God be for us? The miracle that's going to come from this time when we've been sequestered, when we've taken the church and left the building and been deployed to our homes to worship there, is this. We get to be the hands of Christ, showing others that he remains to be the resurrection and the life no matter where we are. Worship is a mode of life, not an hour of our time. When we're called out of our tombs, you and I are asked to now be in a different place, a different mode of, of life. You and I are asked to take God with us wherever and however we are. So it seems that to locate the resurrection in the future, near or distant or anything else, is to misunderstand exactly what it is that Jesus is teaching. Because we get to hear loud and clear. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Is the word dwelling with you wherever you are? As we journey through this season of Lent, through this season of disease, through this season of feeling like we are alone, God actually wants to use this as a season to bring us even closer to him. The words of this gospel tell us loud and clear. This illness will not lead us to death. Rather, let us use it for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Come out of your tomb and worship God in fullness, however and wherever you are. I thank God that he holds my hand as we sit around our table at home and pray before the many meals that we are sharing together that we hadn't been sharing together before now. I give thanks that God's hand is right there with me as we're putting those jigsaw puzzles together. I thank God that he holds our hand as we pound those nails into the board, as we make those projects together. I thank God that he's right there with us as we walk in and through the yard. I thank God that he's right there with us as we laugh and as we play. And yes, even as we struggle. Because our God never leaves us. And never forsakes us. Our God's reaching out today. To hold your hand. To hold your face. And to remind you, I am the resurrection and the life. I will be with you always. Come out of your tombs and find God who lives with you.
in closing, before we sing our final hymn, I would like to share with you a prayer that I read this past week, and it really speaks deeply to the situation. So this prayer comes from a liturgy from Reverend Mindy Welton Mitchell. Let us pray. Prince of Peace, we pray right now for peace in our hearts. We pray that we may take advantage of the world slowing down as a reminder that the Sabbath was created for us, a time of rest. May we lay aside the longing of the world we created to be busy, to do all the things possible. May we lay aside the guilt that we are not doing enough for our work, for our families, for our children, or for our elders in this time. May we instead embrace this new pace and find peace. May we keep ourselves from others to reduce harm, to share our love by our actions of self-isolating, to prevent the spread of disease. Prince of Peace, our fears are real. We fear loss of income and jobs. We fear for our own health and safety and the health and safety of loved ones. We fear what the future may bring. Help us to let go of fear as a force that holds us back. But help us to acknowledge our fear, to sit with it as we do with a troubled friend. Help us to give ourselves compassion and grace as you once showed Martha and Mary when their brother Lazarus died. Help us to hold on to the resurrection in this life, a new life that may emerge from the circumstances we face now. Guide us into your ways of peace for all of our hearts. And all God's people say, Amen. Let us join then in our final hymn, I Know Whom I Have Believed.
unto him against that day. Our God remains true, firm, strong, whole, and with you always. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, blessed to be a blessing right where you are. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. But I know.